Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the PC Perspective Mailbag. Uh, and today we have a host of new questions to answer from users like Dave and Kyle and Scott and Arnold as we go down the list. Just a reminder, if you want a question answered on next week's episode or a future week's episode, uh, leave it in the comments of the YouTube video here below. And if you have any other feedback about audio quality, video quality, uh, suggestions, leave it all there. Leave it all there. We're welcome for it. Let's jump right into it. Dave McLean asks, I was wondering if you could give me a suggestion about selecting a video card for a particular machine of mine. This computer is used uh, for my dyno here at the shop, and it drives 27-inch 4K display with graphical interface. Uh, it is recording data. He's running through an HDMI cable now that only allows 30 hertz refresh rate, but he'd like something that has DisplayPort. Doesn't need to do any gaming or anything else. Uh, just need PCI Express, 4K60, DisplayPort out. Uh, Dave, that could literally be almost any video card that exists uh, from the current NVIDIA lineup or AMD lineup or a couple of generations back. Pretty much 4K60 DisplayPort has been um, in these, these cards for a long time, so it really just depends on what your cost and budget is. Uh, also check the power supply of that system to see how high of a video card it can support and if it has external PCIe connectors and those types of things. Honestly, I'd recommend going with something like a, a GTX 1050 or Radeon RX 550 or something like that that don't require external uh, PCIe connectors, so you don't have to worry about that, and they're kind of built uh, with systems that you're replacing integrated graphics in mind, so you'll have less complications with power draw, power cabling, uh, but anything that has a full-size display port output is, is what you're working with, and you mentioned here you're using the Monoprice uh, 4K monitor, so it should have no issues with that. If you're not doing gaming um, and the, the application you're using is just, you know, like you said, graphical information for this dyno you run, then that should be no problems at all. See, that first one was easy, guys. Quick, right to it. Uh, Kyle Bachman asks a much more difficult one. Could you tell me what a thread does? Um, essentially, a, a thread is kind of the, the smallest division of work that an operating system and or application can handle. Um, when we talk about multi-threaded processors or multi-threaded applications or workloads, what we're kind of referring to is the ability uh, of an operating system or an application to break up work into multiple threads. Um, and it really comes down to does the application have the capability to do that. Uh, a, a thread is basically um, some application instancing a set of data and instructions that it sends off to go handle and address. And if it can do that in more than one parallel method, then it is multi-threaded. So um, think of it as a series of instructions, uh, of a, as, a, as a series of, 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 of data requests, whatever it happens to be, that is the smallest division of work you can have uh, that be, is on a continuous strain. So multi-threaded workloads, multi-threaded applications all kind of tie in together with that. So when we talk about a processor like Ryzen or Threadripper that has 16 cores but can handle 32 threads, in theory, if you have 32 threads running in parallel, they can all operate at the same time. Now keep in mind that your operating system is going to have hundreds if not thousands of threads kind of actively uh, running all at the same time continuously, maybe not pegging the CPU, but existing in some state in memory, right? So um, you're never actually running just a single thread on an operating system like Windows or Linux, right? So uh, something to, to keep that in mind as well. Scott C. wants to ask, I'm thinking of getting back into PC gaming, but I want to use my LG 60-inch 4K HDR TV as my, quote, monitor so that I can game from the couch. Are there any reasons why that wouldn't be possible or anything I need to be, be aware of for this kind of setup? It's, it's absolutely possible for you to do that, and a lot of people that I know of that are gaming on PCs are actually doing it on TVs, not monitors. Now, when it comes right down to it, the, the technical differences between a TV and a monitor are close to zero. I guess you can kind of look at as TVs will tend to have tuners in them, but even then, a, a lot of modern TVs, as they're branded, don't have tuners in them, and they depend on you to have cable boxes or uh, satellite boxes or you know internet attached devices, whatever they happen to be. Uh, the complications of using a 60-inch screen um, are, are problematic if you're trying to put it on a desk, but if you want to sit on a couch and do it, your biggest complication is going to be on the user interface, right? So navigating the machine when you boot it up uh, will require you to get something like 
uh, a wireless keyboard with a trackpad on it or uh, one of those gyroscopic mice. Um, you can have it boot straight into Steam Big Picture mode. And even though I like Steam Big Picture mode, which is a 10-foot style user interface that they created to let you interact with Steam games and libraries on a TV, it, it's, it doesn't feel like it's been updated, that it's not super reliable. There's still some instances where when you do certain things, like you launch a game, you have to hit OK on a window, and you can only do that with a mouse cursor. You can't do it with a controller because it changes focus. There's some oddities like that. So that's kind of what you, what you need to be aware of. Um, if it were me and I was doing this, I would have a PC hooked up to the TV through you know an HDMI port, and then I would have... Um, I, I don't remember who I don't know who makes anything like this anymore. I'm sure Logitech does makes a keyboard with a touchpad attached to it, so it's all one wireless piece. You're not going to use it for gaming necessarily, uh, but just for navigation and ease of use. You can leave it on the coffee table or on the couch with you. Uh, and then I would get an Xbox controller, like a like an Xbox One wireless controller, and use that to play as many of the games as you could. If you want to get into using a keyboard and mouse while gaming on the couch, you get into in another issue where you have to have a, a platform for your keyboard and mouse to remain and stable. They are devices like the Couch Master, which does exactly what you think it does, that it prevents a hard, flat surface for you to put a keyboard and a mouse on your lap. Uh, a long time ago when I was doing this very thing, I bought a, like a hospital TV tray off of Amazon, took the casters off of it, and set it on the carpet with like carpet sliders. Right, and I used that as a keyboard and mouse tray. So there's other options you can, you can get into that way. For me, I would probably go with a controller for the most part for the games that I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But if you are a dedicated PC mouse uh, or a keyboard mouse gamer, then that's probably where the biggest question mark will come into play. Arnold Hillman asks, what are your thoughts on the 385.12 Titan XP driver updates? with regards to performance improvement with professional applications. Do you think we will see this type of performance improvement in games with other GPUs? Also, do you feel NVIDIA is purposely holding back on performance? Um, so the 385.12 driver is the version that AMD released some weeks after the Radeon uh, Vega Frontier Edition card came out. And what it did was it essentially unlocked some of the capabilities, some of the performance improvements that existed in the Quadro line of drivers for professional applications, Maya, Creo, those types of things that uh, were kind of being, you know, artificially withheld from the GPU. The GPU was always capable of running these different code paths and these accelerated um, performance levels, but they, they held it back for product differentiation, to be fair, right? They, they created this market for Quadro parts. Um, the Titan XP was always kind of meant to be somewhere between the gaming card and the professional card, um, but they didn't have access to the full allotment of, of performance tweaks that you see in the much more expensive, to be fair, Quadro line. When the Vega Frontier Edition came out, that got turned up on its, on its head because AMD, knowing that they were struggling in the market share, and they were they were you know trying desperately to sell these cards for a thousand dollars and fifteen hundred dollars a piece. Saw the opportunity to take their you know Radeon Pro slash what used to be called Fire Pro line of cards and move it forward. Uh, kind of bring that capability down into another card and do anything it could basically to try to get market share improvements over where it currently sat, which is pretty low in, in the Quadro space. Um, so now, when, once that had happened, AMD had a $1,000 card that had significantly better performance in some professional applications than, uh, you know, the $1,000, $1,200 card from NVIDIA and, you know, even going into the several thousand dollars Quadro cards. As a result, I don't think if there's any getting around it, NVIDIA released that driver that unlocked some of those performance improvements, which now then give it a significant performance increase in those areas that make it either more competitive or faster the, uh, than, the, than the Vega FE at that point. Um, you do not see that type of performance improvement in games. It's, it is not some you know, GPU hardware feature that they suddenly unlocked that now is working on games. It is essentially a code path, like a certified code path for very specific applications uh, that they've unlocked. It's not going to affect your gaming. It's not going to make your Titan XP better, you know, 40% faster in any particular game, 
Um, so, so I don't think you'll see that, obviously. And I kind of already answered the question of are they purposely holding back the performance? I mean, they're purposely holding back the Titan XP from being higher performing in professional workloads. And the same is true of like the 1080 Ti. Could the 1080 Ti, could the GTX 1080, did the GTX 1070 run faster in professional workloads if they released a different driver later down the road that unlocked those? They absolutely could. But I don't, you know, they're not going to do it until they have to. You can you can see that as artificially holding back performance, or you can view it as, you know, just business practices where they, they understand the the consumer that's looking for those benefits is somebody who has a budget, has a corporate back uh, uh, backing for the financial side of it, and they just are trying to increase their their margins where they can. Um, but that's that's just where it stands. But hey, this is why competition and pressure are really important. CPU space, GPU space everywhere. It forces those types of changes uh, forward. John Edget asks, when is the next 12 hour live stream? I don't know if anybody can see Ken behind me back there. Ken, Ken says probably next week. Ken's already been preparing for it. <laughs> Um, he said he said for sure next week. Uh, I don't know when we'll do another one of those. It was um, fun. It was a lot of planning and work. I think it actually turned out pretty pretty well. Maybe if we want to do some other kind of like Patreon drive or something like that, we, we would use it for that. But literally for the last many months, we have been so busy that planning something of uh, that much complication would be a nightmare. Um, we have everything personnel-wise, technological-wise, to make it happen again. So, so maybe we'll see one day you know, when we all have a lot of free time. Um, we'll we'll probably get down to that. Take that for what you will, I guess. John STF seventy two asks: Do you think that water cooling will be a requirement now that six plus core CPUs are slowly becoming more mainstream? Will classic air cooled setups still have a place in future builds? Also. Which type of water cooling setup will likely last longer, an all-in-one or a custom loop? John, uh, I don't really, th mm, I don't, I wouldn't agree necessarily that water cooling will be a requirement now that we see six plus core CPUs going forward. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, keep in mind that that Ryzen Threadripper, or not Threadripper, let's take that out of there. Ryzen seven and five technically had a ninety-five watt TDP. They went above that, uh, but. There, there's plenty of air coolers that work just fine for the eight core, six core uh, Ryzen family CPUs. And if you look at Cabby Lake, still the most popular um, consumer DIY part, um, it, it's perfectly fine air cooled as well. Now, you look at Skylake X, you look at Threadripper, and clearly there's a move to not force you into water cooling, but just saying, hey, we don't really care if we exceed the normal boundaries of, of thermal dissipation necessary because we're going to get these different CPUs. I think all the rumors show that the six core Intel parts they're going to come out with are going to maintain the same TDP. And Intel can do that because they have a process technology advantage and they're also, you know, they're balancing, you know, the, the higher clock speeds for single and dual threaded or single and dual core situations where those are heavily loaded and then when you're running all six or 12 threads um, very heavily, you're gonna run at lower frequency. Um, if we start to see another gigahertz battle, which, you know, hey, everybody likes some change every now and again, uh, you may see a, a return back to like water cooling only in the mainstream or water cooling recommended at least in the mainstream, but I kind of I kind of hope we don't get there, right? Is is we use all-in-one coolers for all of our testing here, uh, but mostly because we expect to be doing overclocking testing every time we're doing something, and also they they're you know I guess I'll still say it, they're, they're most of the time they're a little bit quieter than air coolers, but even that's kind of uh, not really the case anymore, and so we kind of wanted to do it just for consistency uh, throughout the office. Um, so yes, I do think air cooled builds will still have a place in in future builds. As for which type of water cooling setup will last longer, it really, that's I mean I don't know how to answer that question other than it depends on what your budget's going to be. An all in one cooler, you know, I I will freely admit based on previous uh, questions we've done in this mailbag that I don't feel like they last as long as they should. Um, we either get they're noisy, uh, the the either the you get some fluid dissipation, so you're getting some extra air bubbles, or you're, you know, the, the pump is a little bit louder than it should be as it wears out. Um, 
I still think a couple of years is is a good estimate for that. And you're getting those for anywhere from 100 to 150 bucks. Uh, a custom DIY loop, if you buy good hardware, is going to last much longer than that, and it will also give you flexibility to upgrade and change things down the line. But you're going to spend more than 100 bucks, right? There's no you're going to spend probably much more than that, depending on how high a quality you get. So um, the other thing you have to worry about when you get an, an, uh, when you get a custom loop is if you upgrade CPUs, say you were on a Core i7 and now you want to buy a Threadripper, you're going to have to buy a different block, right? And so that's you know probably the price of an uh, of a decent all-in-one cooler in and of itself. So how much how long they last is you know I think you you'll get more life out of individual components with the custom loop. But uh, in terms of you know longevity per dollar, I don't get a feeling that there's a, a clear winner one way or the other. Um, and, and the all-in-ones are just super easy to deal with, especially if you're only cooling one component. If you're only going to cool your CPU, then you know custom loop might be a little bit much to go in there. If you plan on cooling a whole bunch of stuff, multiple GPUs and the CPU, um, then you got a, a bigger project on your hand. Tech We Love asks, what microphone and or audio equipment are you using to create your podcast? If I buy a lav mic, what other equipment do I need to make it sound great? Um, so the microphones we actually use in the podcast are Heil PR40s. So they're um, you know more high quality studio grade microphones like you know audio recording, radio studio grade microphones. Um, you don't have to have anything like that to record good audio podcasts. This, the audio I record on this is a is a monoprice USB attached microphone and it sounds pretty darn good for, you know, it's 30 to $50 price tag whatever it happens to be. You know, I would I would avoid headsets, gaming headsets tend to have very thin tinny audio. You want something that's going to capture a little bit of the low end of your voice. Um, but not too much of it, I guess, at the same time. Um, if you get a lav mic, those will work just fine for podcasts. We use lav mics for our non-podcast videos here. The problem with those is uh, they tend, tend to be omnidirectional, so they're going to pick up more background noise. The Hiles do a very good job of kind of um, noise activation, but it also means you have to talk directly at the microphone, right? Like if I turn this microphone around like this, suddenly you're not going to be able to hear me very well because of its cardioid kind of pickup pattern. So uh, things to be aware of there. In terms of other equipment, if you're doing audio only, USB mic, uh, there's software to record Skype calls if that's what you're doing. If you're, if you're gonna go into the video world, you're gonna get all kinds of complication, right? You can just use webcams. I'm just using a webcam, a Logitech uh, Brio 4K webcam here for this. Um, you know, Google Hangouts is the easy way to do it. Um, but if you get into other things, and we have we have multiple Skype calls going at the same time, we have um, we're using vMix as mixing software to switch between things. Um, you can use Wirecast for that. Uh, there's plus and minuses to everything in this regard. I, I you know, Heil PR40. I, I I definitely like the microphones, but they're pretty pricey, and that's XLR. So then you have to go into a mixer. And then you have to go, you know, something that's going to take it from analog to digital into your PC, right? So we use Scarlet devices for some of that. We use, uh, um, uh, yeah, no, we use the Scarlet to take from our main 16-channel mixer into the PC itself to record audio there. So there's a whole different world that you could dive into with that type of stuff. So uh, be careful on how much money you actually want to spend. Matt Lockization, which is a pretty great name Matt Lockization wants to know hey Ryan how come you don't allow chat during your live streams uh, well we do have a chat during our live streams I assume you're talking about the YouTube chat uh, we disable that basically because if you go to pcper.com slash live when we do our live streams we have an IRC based chat room there that has an easy easy to use kind of like web client that you can just click join and you don't have to register for it or whatever um, on that page and the reason we wanted to do that is we kind of had that audience that was already there most of the time and we didn't want to have break up the audience too much and in fact we have you know we, we live stream to twitch and there's a chat there i don't think we have the ability to disable that but we kind of wanted to push everybody and filter them into one single location so that we could watch one area to interact with uh with the chat during our live streams so it's not that we um 
don't allow chat is that you're probably going to the YouTube page and if you read in the description on those pages, it'll show you, it'll give you a link to pcpro.com slash live um, where you can see the the IRC chat there. And we've got a pop out and all that type of stuff. So if you want to, you know, put it in another window or whatever, or even just drag it on top of the video stream, you can do the, all that, all that type of stuff too. So please do, please, please, please turn me over. Uh, let's see. Bobalob uh, asks, what are the approximate specs of the first PC you built? Uh, I have no clue other than the first PC I built myself had a AMD K62 processor. So uh, uh, an AMD K62 probably would have been on a PC chips branded motherboard. And I don't remember the 2D video card I had, but the 3D video card I had was a Diamond Monster. So that was back in the days when you had a 3D accelerator that you added on to the addition uh, uh, to, your, to your video card, and then it had a pass-through. So you had an analog cable between the two to pass to pass data through, uh, and you could do true SLI then, which was actual scan line interleave, where it actually rendered every other line uh, of the of the image. Uh, but I don't remember how much memory I had or anything like that. Um, but uh, that that kind of goes back away. I had we had I had a com I had computers before that, some that were you know like an HP pre-built. I had one built uh, by a local company that was like a custom PC that. I you know was too young and my mom and dad didn't trust me to to spend that kind of money and buy all those components myself. And then I do remember uh, I think I was 15. I was working at an electronics boutique, and there was a guy who was older than me. He's like 22, and he was going to a computer shop or no a computer convention right um, in northern Kentucky area uh, to go look at and browse through parts. And I just went with him. Help, watched him, I didn't help him, I watched him pick out all the parts and then went back to his place and watched him build his PC. And that's kind of where I first got to see um, that process take place, uh, which was which was pretty interesting. But yeah, I, it was, mine was probably an AMD K62, probably before the K62 Plus. So what's that put it, 2000, no, 99, 98, 97, 96, something like that maybe? Yeah, I'd have to go look those up. All right, we'll do one more question. This one comes in from Michael Saletti. Ryan, are you originally from Kentucky? How did you end up at UK? What is your favorite bourbon? Go Big Blue. Yeah, I like this question. Uh, yes, I am originally from Kentucky. I was born in northern Kentucky. I guess technically I was born in Covington. Um, but my family, mom and dad, were, were uh, in Florence. You know, I, I grew up here in northernmost part just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I ended up at University of Kentucky because they paid for me to go to school there. The university did, I mean, so I had a scholarship. Um, it was far enough away from home at two hours or so, hour and a half, uh, that I could come back and bring laundry, but also mom couldn't bother me, right? So that's how I ended up there. Uh, fav what is my favorite bourbon? Um, you know, you got easy answers, like if you want to go super high-end bourbon. Um, but I'll go with my favorite moderately priced bourbon is Russell's Reserve 10-year, which is like $40, $50 a bottle or something like that. Uh, it's really, really good. Um, I, don't, mm, I don't think I have any here in the office, so I'll have to fix that. I think I might have some at the house, but that's if, if I if I get a chance, that's usually what I'll pick up and buy to have to actually drink bourbon, not to mix it with anything. If I'm going to mix it, you know, there's anything bottom shelf will work just fine for that. But uh, that that would be my recommendation. So, all right, I think that's going to do it for this week, guys. Uh, if you have questions, I have a couple more here. Uh, that we'll, we'll add to the list next week as well. But if you have questions for me, leave them in the comments here. Uh, we go through them every you know handful of days and, and cull some out and, and look and add them to our list. And it may not be the next week, but it might be the week after. So we're going we're gonna to keep this up. So thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.